Uh, my name is Ben Farrell. Uh, I work at Adobe Design. We'll get into a little bit about my, uh, my job in a bit. You can find me on Twitter at bfarrellforever. Um, we're all here for web components, but I want to talk about web components in space. Um, so uh, just to back up a little bit, uh, Gray gave a great intro on how we have all modern browsers covered right now. So you know, kind of 2019, I was saying web components have landed because we have the, we had the beta of uh, Chromium-based Edge. But 2020, we're, it's really here. And, and to, to add to, on to that, we have some great tooling from folks like OpenWC, some great minimal tooling that really help uh, your project along. Um, declarative UI with LitHTML and LitElement. The Polymer team are killing it. Some great tools there. Um, Salesforce has Lightning. We got Ionic, Vaadin, webcomponents.dev. Savo, just, he, he's going to talk next about runtime.dev. Uh, we got compilers, uh, component libraries, front end tooling. The list goes on. It's an amazing scene. Um, but wait, I think a couple people on the internet might have unfavorable opinions about web components. Um, and I honestly, if they didn't, I'd be slightly worried because you know any up and coming, anything that's getting adoption, people are going to push back a little bit against, and that's totally okay, right? Um, but it's also okay because you want to use the best tool for your project. So web components are a great option. I say so. Uh, another person might say frameworks are great too. Um, either either way, there's tons of different needs on the web, and I want to talk about how my needs are slightly different than yours might be. Um, and the reason why my needs are slightly different is because I do prototyping at Adobe Design. I don't ship actual products like a lot of you do. Um, so I think my needs are slightly different in that regard. So when I say prototyping, um, there's, a, there's an art to it. Um, and it's really about prototyping adds confidence to a design before we set it off to engineering to start building the actual product. So I might work with a designer, and they'll send a design on, and I'll prototype it out. And we'll find the rough edges. We'll find where the user experience isn't quite right. And we'll go back and forth. Um, and we'll improve the design. We'll improve the prototype. But then it goes on to user research. And user research will uh, come in with some people and test out the design. And they'll have even more feedback for us. And it's a great scene because it adds that confidence. Um, I like web components when I'm prototyping because my designs constantly change. And I feel like web components allow me to adapt really quickly to what I'm building. Um, and it's, and you know, prototyping also gives you like a, it's a testing grounds for emerging technology, um, which you'll see a little bit tonight. So my experiments slash prototypes slash side projects slash whatever lately, um, I'm doing. I really, I, 3D and web XR is kind of my jam lately. Like I really, I really love playing around in uh, VR headsets, like this Quest here, um, and um, my opinion when you're talking about all this emerging technology. Uh, frameworks just seem to get in the way for me. I remember like way back when I was using Angular 1, um, I think CSS animations were just coming out or something like that. And, and I was trying to do something with CSS animations in Angular, but it was just totally getting in my way. And I ended up creating a directive. And it was just, uh, it, I could have done this easily in HTML and CSS. And so that's why I feel like frameworks, they can get in the way. Um, front end tooling makes, you know, if it's, if it's so complex of front-end tooling, it, when you go off the beaten path, it gets harder and harder to like, add on to it. So I really like minimal stuff when I'm developing. And my point is, you stay saner the closer you are to the platform, I feel like. And that's why I wrote this. I mean, Web Components in Action is <clears throat> it's a Web Components book. It's really about the standards. It doesn't really get into the, the ecosystem we have today with all the tools we have. It's really about the standards and how you can build things just with the standards. Um, and when I started this, it was a while ago, um, and I was really hoping like Web Components will take off. I was kind of betting. This was before, I mean, it was before Chrome even shipped V1 of Web Components, and it was definitely before Firefox shipped Web Components, definitely before Edge shipped Web Components. Um, so I was really hoping something would come out of this, and good news, it did. So in the past two years since I started this book, Web Components have been like, it's been, it's been my jam. I, I really like developing with them, especially for prototyping. So since they're so stable, I think we should take Web Components to space. So, and I'll tell you why. The reason why, James Bond, 1962, came to movie screens with Dr. No. He started this spy franchise. Um, what's that? <laughs> Um, so it lasted nine more movies, and then it took a chance on space. Um, so 1979, Moonraker, 
was the highest grossing film to date, which is awesome, except it was completely ridiculous. Um, this is an actual scene from the movie. I, I watched it last week, because I actually I realized I hadn't caught up on it. Um, it's campy, there's a, they're shooting astronauts in space. I mean, what is, what is going on? Um, so it's completely ridiculous, but the point is it didn't jump the shark. Bond lasted 40 more years, it's still going. Daniel Craig's releasing a film uh, in April. So the point here is we saw, the, we saw the absurd edges of what James Bond could take on, and it proved to be a long-lasting formula, and I think it's partly because they went to space. Um, and it's not unique to Bond. Leprechaun went to space, Looney Tunes went to space, Muppets went to space, and I think web components should go to space too. And again, the reason is because I want to find those absurd edges and bring those lessons back to Earth, where things actually matter, where you're all doing production code, um, and you can learn those lessons and see what not to do, maybe what to do. Um, and one of those lessons, um, this, is, this is one of the reasons I got into web components, because you know you could talk about CSS encapsulation or JavaScript encapsulation, but I really like the, the concept of encapsulating really complex ideas. So you maybe may have thousands of lines of code, you wrap it all up in this tiny little tag, you can use it, provide an API, all that complexity is hidden and it goes away and it's amazing. Um, I think a great example of this is Google's model viewer. Um, so model viewer, under the hood, it uses 3JS. 3D engines are huge, they're big. I mean, it's probably like a, a megabyte of JavaScript code. Um, it, and um, it also has augmented reality support. So I could take this astronaut on the screen, I could put him on the floor in the real world with my smartphone, and it'll work with this component. Um, lots of API attributes for, like, the main use case here is, is showing a 3D model. What, and, and there's lots of different ways to show that. Um, so just real quick, I wanna go to model viewer and show this astronaut. So um, right here, and you can see this all, extensive API for doing tons of things with it. But the cool thing is, it is a web component, so we can open up this, um, we, can, we can look at the tag, and then we can just start changing things. So, uh, where's the color? Uh, let's see. This is different. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, so like, maybe we don't want it to auto-rotate, so we're gonna take that attribute off. And so all of a sudden, it's, it's in a mode where it doesn't auto-rotate for you. You might want that turntable, you might not. Um, and then maybe you don't want the camera controls. Make it less responsive. Just, I don't know why you'd want to show a static 3D uh, model, but now I can't control it with the camera. So my point here is, and I was gonna show you the, the background. I don't remember the attribute, and it's not here in this latest one, but whatever. Um, but the point is, there's tons of different ways you can customize this, and, the, and, it, and it's hiding all this complexity from you. Um, and another one, uh, let's see. A-frame is another great example. Um, so A-frame is technically not a web component yet. It uses document.register element under the hood. So if you know that's a V0 um, custom element uh, definition, um, it uses a polyfill. They're gonna change it soon. Um, but the point here is it's kind of interesting because in addition to visual components, they're using non-visual components. Um, and hopefully they have, I can change the color this time. Um, so this is like kind of their hello world scene. And the interesting thing about this is you can see this A dash scene tag. You can see that's an element. It takes up space on the page. It holds a 3D canvas. It encapsulates a lot of uh, logic and complexity. But if you look at this A box, if you notice the tiny uh, tag up at the screen, the tooltip, it's up in the upper left hand corner. And it's zero by zero width and height. So it's not actually showing in the DOM. It's, but it's here in the DOM, in the DOM tree. So it's A-frame's kind of using the DOM structure to inform the 3D canvas, so we can suddenly change that blue box there over to a cylinder. And it's, it's responsive on those uh, HTML, uh, the tag and the attributes, so I can change, I can actually change the color this time. So I'll change that cylinder to red, and then maybe change the rotation a little bit. And I think that's pretty cool, uh, just, in the, just in the way, like, I wouldn't have thought to do non-visual components, but I guess, like, Vaadin web components, like, they had the router that a bunch of us used, too, so it's an interesting use case. Um, and uh, wrapping complexity for use as an easy starting point is another lesson um, I was experimenting around with. So I created something called Babylon Scene. Now, Babylon is another uh, uh, 3D engine. 
I prefer it to 3JS, but they're both amazing. Um, and their creators are awesome, too. Um, it's, it's not really a competition with them. It's kind of just a hug. Um, and so you can easily create, with, with this, I want to enable you to easily create a 3D scene. There's tons of code to write to like create a 3D scene, attach it to your canvas, uh, set up your cameras, set up your lights. It's like hundreds of lines of code. But here, I want to encapsulate that all and allow you to build off of it. So I want to hide that complexity and, and allow you to customize it. And um, just using like this attribute as an entry point. So you pass in this ES6 module, and that's what defines your application. And you're really only saying, I want this cube on the screen, or do much more with that customization. Um, another, another interesting thing coming from the web community is OpenWC's ES Dev Server. So if you're familiar with bare module imports, um, you know, if you're using like the, the syntax like at lit HTML, um, you know, you're not providing the whole relative or absolute path to lit HTML in your node modules folder. With the bare module imports, you can't, it just doesn't work with a normal HTTP server. So ES Dev Server steps in and handles all that for you. Well, an interesting thing about using Babylon.js is you can use ES6 modules, but they suggest Webpack in their documentation. But when you use ES Dev Server over on Babylon, it just magically works. And it becomes a situation where you can start typing code, creating your 3D scene, refresh your browser without having to bundle, without having to build, um, and it all just works. So I think that's a great contribution. Like, it's, a, it's just a general contribution from the web components community to the entire web scene. Um, and then, uh, so on a more like serious type of application, um, I found that traditional 2D UI libraries, like whether you pick a framework, whether you pick LitHTML or Lit Element, they're all really good and they help until they hurt. And to explain that, so a typical, this is a typical, a generic 3D app I might prototype. I have prototyped it. Um, and it contains 2D UI on the sides and a 3D canvas in the middle. You might figure out, oh, this is how I want to build it. I'm going to put LitHTML on the sides, Babylon JS in the middle. Um, but the point here is, whoops. Let's, I want to open up this project real quick. just to show all the complexity that's involved here. Um, so here's that generic 3D app. And you know, this is normal 2D UI stuff. Like, there's, nothing, there's nothing terribly hard about you know, doing some drop-down menus, selecting a 3D object. But once you're here in this 3D canvas, there's a lot of code to make this happen, to make the gnome scale, to make them rotate. Um, I got some cloning gnome action here. Many times a gnome. Um, but the point is, like, there's so much code here, and it's a kind of a separate world. Like, HTML and CSS doesn't live here at all. And if you kind of look at the application structure here, um, we're talking about like a, a one comp one web component that holds a single canvas. There's no reason to use a framework here. There's no reason to use LitHTML here. In fact, these types of things get in the way. But the great thing about LitHTML, the element from the Polymer team, is that you don't have to use them. It, they, you just ignore them completely on this component where you don't want it. And I think that's a great thing about this, this ecosystem we're in, this, this scene we're in. Um, and my last lesson is that the best libraries are small, easy to understand and extend, and they're flex and they're hackable. Um, and, um, and of course, I'm talking about uh, the Polymer team's lit HTML and lit element. Um, so here's my little challenge that I wanted to try, just because I like VR. And I want to take a lit element component in 3D and get it to render in VR. So there's some tricks to that, and it's a total hack, but it kind of shows how flexible these tools are. Um, so HTML element, any div you have, you can't just scrape the pixels and throw it in a canvas. Um, you can't capture that. But an image tag, you can, and also a video element. So the trick here is you can actually assign an SVG element or SVG string to an image source and have that be your image tag and scrape the pixels from there. But even more so, have you guys ever heard of the foreign object tag? This can actually live inside an SVG object and hold a bunch of HTML, and it actually works. Um, and so like custom elements actually work here. 
And lit element, lit HTML, it has no trouble either. So we can start creating, we can start with lit element and start creating an XR component base class, like a lit XR, I would call it. Um, unfortunately, because of the shadow boundaries with the shadow DOM, like you can't like grab all this SVG trees through the shadow boundaries. So luckily, lit HTML, lit element, lit element will let you to turn that off, the shadow DOM. I wish, I wish it was there, because I love the shadow DOM. Um, but here's kind of an application you might have. So you have a bunch of, just like a lit, lit uh, element application, but you have a bunch of lit uh, components in there, and then you all send them down to SVG to a, a component, and that blitz uh, over to a plane in 3D space. Um, and so uh, it's, it's, what I wanted to show here is it's really lightweight, uh, extending the LinuxR base class. Um, the most, the, probably the worst thing I've, d I've done here is overridden request update. So you know when like H lit HTML comes in and says, I have some DOM changes for you, I'm gonna render those things. I hijack that and I say, you're also going to serialize all the SVG and send it to the, the texture and the screen. So um, there's not much there. There's some things that uh, I had to play around with. Um, images don't work, so SVG requires base64 encoded images and there's no interaction yet. Um, because remember, we're cl actually clicking in VR on a 3D canvas and not on the actual DOM element itself, so it, there's some weirdness. Um, now, lit HTML, it has these things called directives. So um, normally you might not use them, but they're a nice feature. They're kind of a, a, um, an escape hatch, if you will. Um, so we can use a directive to base64 encode those images. So I'm gonna create my own image directive. I'm gonna pass in this uh, source. And then here's, it's this so tiny, it's the directive I wrote, and it just loads up that image, converts it to a, a blobby data string, and assigns that to the source, and you're good to go with SVG. Um, and the interaction problem, so we're actually gonna hack lit HTML for this. Um, and so if you, if you know lit HTML, you know you can do at click and do an action. Um, it's a nice little syntax, it doesn't really infect your HTML, it's really nice. Um, we're gonna say, Anything that at click is assigned to, we're gonna inject our own logic to add this thing to a master list of all these elements that we can uh, perform actions on coming from VR, that 3D canvas. Um, so uh, the, one, the thing I did here is I uh, hacked open uh, LitHTML's template processor, added my own thing to it, and then exported it again. Um, and you might think, this is a really bad thing because we're, you don't want to break a framework like this. It's just gonna like, it's bad news. But the thing is, uh, lit HTML, it's isolated. So I can break it in this one instance, but then my, and I import that one instance in this one case where I'm doing bad things, but elsewhere I can use the normal lit HTML and it's not, it's just completely isolated so everything's gonna work even though I'm doing dumb things. So I think that's, I think it's a really good lesson. Um, and I just want to show, um, all this working in WebVR. So, all right. So, obviously you can see it, right? So, um, and uh, it's interactive now, and there's hover states as well because of all the all the weirdness we've done here. So, I can change it to a cylinder. I can go ahead and use this slider. Um, so again, this is, this is a lit element web component rendering in VR. And I like this idea of like, you know, we gotta start somewhere. We gotta take this, these 2D concepts and bring them to VR before we go crazy with, uh, you know, just doing all the production work of, around 3D. So, you know, at the end of the day, I think, you know, take it for what you will, but my lessons, like, as a prototyper, again, I have different problems than you guys. I just need solutions that don't get in the way, and I feel like, on, especially on side projects, this might be true for you. So speedy development and refactoring, this needs to be possible. Um, and I think web components really do accomplish this in a big way, and, I, in, and it does this by allowing you to work more closely with just plain old vanilla HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, and just adding on things where it helps and taking them away where it doesn't. Um, and then uh, tooling like from the OpenWC, uh, like ES Dev Server, it can be extremely minimal or non-existent. It just helps where it helps you and doesn't hurt where you don't want it to. Um, and, and likewise with uh, lit HTML and lit element, um, 
helps where you want to. I, it I completely isolates when you do dumb things. So I think you know web components really have that great uh, environment right now where you can do this kinds of things. So thank you very much. Thank you.